Well, welcome to this talk on diabetes mellitus. And the bulk of this DVD is going to be about diabetes mellitus. Now, diabetes is an old English word, and the term diabetes means to go through or to flow through. It was sometimes used to describe a siphon where water is siphoned off. So what the word diabetes really means is polyuria. Water is flowing out of the body. There's a large urine volume. So diabetes refers to polyuria. There's large urine volumes. And the term mellitus means sweet. Sometimes it referred to honey. It means sweetness. So in diabetes mellitus, there's large volumes of urine and that urine is sweet. And this disease has been recognised for thousands of years. Doctors have always realised that some patients would develop polyuria and when you tasted the urine, it would be sweet. Thankfully, we don't need to taste it now. We've got dipsticks to tell us whether there's sugar in it or not. But I want to be absolutely clear before we really get into the meat of this talk about our definitions. So diabetes refers to a polyuria. There's a lot of water going through the body. That's what diabetes means. And just to clarify the situation to begin with, we want to point out that there's two types of diabetes. And I made up one of my little uh, mind maps here. So we've got diabetes. What are the two types? Well, there's insipidus and there's mellitus. And as I said, this talk is about diabetes mellitus. But before we do that, let's just get diabetes insipidus out of the way. It's very interesting, but it's not really the topic of this video. So insipidus, insipid means watery. You know, if you taste something and you say, mm, this, is a bit, this is a bit insipid, it's watery. So what you get in diabetes insipidus is a polyuria, but that urine is watery. It's certainly not sweet. It's very light coloured. It's insipid. It's watery urine. And it's got a low specific gravity. There is not a high solute load in the urine because there's very large volumes. And in fact, patients with diabetes insipidus can pass up to 20 litres of urine a day. So typically between 5 and 20 litres of urine are passed per day. And given that the patient's passing out such large volumes of urine, it's not surprising that they become thirsty because they're dehydrated and they drink a lot. That's called polydipsia. So first of all, there's a polyuria, large volumes of urine. To compensate for that, the patient feels very thirsty, drinks a lot and has polydipsia. Now, actually, there's two types of diabetes insipidus. There's the cranial type and the nephrogenic type. Now, the cranial type starts within the cranial cavity. And within the cranial cavity, there's a gland called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland has two lobes, the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. And one of the hormones secreted by the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is the antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And the old fashioned name for the antidiuretic hormone was vasopressin. When it was originally discovered, it was realised it could close blood vessels down. But what the antidiuretic hormone does is it is anti-diuretic. Now, what does a diuretic drug do? Well, a diuretic drug will increase urine volumes. But this hormone is not diuretic, it's antidiuretic. So it's going to reduce urine volumes. So the more antidiuretic hormone there is, the lower the urine volumes will be. What it actually does is it increases tubular reabsorption from the nephrons back into the blood. So the antidiuretic hormone will increase the amount of glomerular filtrate reabsorbed. Therefore, that will lower the amount of filtrate in the nephrons. Therefore, urine volumes will be lowered. And in the cranial type, the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is not producing enough antidiuretic hormone. Therefore, you don't have the antidiuretic effect. Therefore, you do have the excess diuresis lack of antidiuretic hormone. But there's an also another form called the nephrogenic form, 
Nephro means to do with the kidneys. And in the nephrogenic form, the kidneys are unable to respond to normal levels of antidiuretic hormone, so still produce very large volumes of urine. But the cause is a fault in the kidneys, not the fault in the pituitary gland in the cranial cavity. Now the cranial type, the lack of ADH, we can give nasal sprays of vasopressin and that will help to treat this condition. And the nephrogenic type, we actually treat that with thiazide type diuretics such as bendroflumethazone. Anyway, that's the insipid type. So that, that, that's that kind of out of the way. So basically what this means in clinical practice is if a patient starts producing large volumes of urine, is it sweet or not? If there's no sugar in it, it could be the insipidus form. But having said that, the insipid form is pretty rare anyway. You're probably not going to come across it very often in your careers, actually. It's pretty rare. But diabetes mellitus is not rare by any means. Whatever clinical field you find yourself working in, it's pretty well a guarantee you're going to, cross, going to come across plenty of cases of diabetes mellitus. In the UK at the moment, it's probably at least 4% of the population. In other countries, it's much more than this. I was working in Cambodia recently, and the amount of diabetes mellitus in Cambodia is maybe 10, 15% or more of the population actually suffers from diabetes mellitus. So it's a very common condition. You'll come across it on medical wards, on surgical wards, on paediatric wards, on care of the elderly wards, in any community setting, you're going to come across diabetes mellitus. So we all need a pretty good background in diabetes mellitus. It's a condition we need to understand and we need to be able to manage in our patients. So diabetes, watery to go through, mellitus, sweet. And let's be absolutely clear, there's two types of diabetes mellitus. And fortunately, they're called type 1 and type 2, so it's quite easy. Now, type 1, when I was a student, was called juvenile onset diabetes. And it's still usually true that this tends to develop or present in young people. Unfortunately, it can present in childhood. Typically, it's round about adolescence, 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age. But having said that, it's less common, but it can present at any stage in life. So I've come across very young children, teenagers, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s. I think I've come across people in the 50s and even in their 60s developing type 1 diabetes. So it can occur at any age of life, but more typically it is a juvenile onset. And it's always an IDDM. It's an insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. These patients must have insulin or they'll die. Before insulin was available, these patients used to be diagnosed and within a few months they would all die. They are dependent on insulin. And in parts of the world today where insulin is not available, tragically, these patients will still die. They are dependent on insulin. It's an IDDM, an insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Type 2. When I was a student, we called this maturity onset diabetes. And this is still basically true. It tends to develop in people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. It's maturity onset. And to begin with, it's not insulin dependent. It's an NIDDM, a non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So sometimes initially these patients can just be managed with good diet control. Other times they might go on to need oral hypoglycemics, drugs to bring the blood sugar down that they take in tablet form. But after several years of diagnosis, typically after the patient's been diagnosed for about seven or eight years, they might actually need insulin as well to maintain their blood glucose control. So initially, it's a non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, but it can go on to become an insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. But it occurs typically in, in later life. 
So diabetes mellitus, type 1, insulin dependent, type 2 can be initially non-insulin dependent, but then go on to be insulin dependent. Now what we want to do next is look at the background physiology of how glucose is controlled, because diabetes is a metabolic disease, and particularly we want to think about its effects on glucose. And then we'll go on and look at the difference between type 1 and type 2 in pathophysiological terms, which we'll hopefully then be able to apply to our individual patients and the patients under our care.